Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Matt Lutepolo, and on behalf of OTC Markets, as well as, well as our co-hosts, Murdoch Capital Partners and TAA Advisory, we're very pleased you have joined us for our next live presentation from Avalon Advanced Materials, Inc. Before I introduce our speaker, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the question box to the left of the slides. If you are interested in scheduling a meeting with Avalon, please click on the Meetings tab found on the left navigation bar. You will be able to view the company's availability and submit a meeting request. On a final note, all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Don Bubar, President and CEO of Avalon Advanced Materials, Inc., which trades on the OTCQB venture market under the symbol AVLNF and on the TSX under the symbol AVL. Welcome, Don. Thanks, Matt. Good to be back here again and provide uh, all your listeners with an update on our progress on our lithium project here, where we are making good progress. Although it took us 25 years to get to this point in time, our time has finally come. <laughs> So this is your reminder on all the forward-looking statements I'll be uh, making today. First slide here is just our, some background information on the uh, company. I got it started back in 1995 and first acquired our lithium project in 1997. I saw the future then, long before anyone else did. <laughs> but. As I said earlier, our time has finally come. And right now, we're, um, we have a fairly low market capitalization. So I'm trying to encourage more people to start to recognize us as, uh, as a lithium equity with quite a bit of upside from here. We just haven't had the news flow that a lot of other juniors that are doing uh, exploration drilling have been able to put out there. So... Um, most of what we've been doing is under NDA and uh, can't really disclose it as quickly as we would like to, but lots of good news coming. So hopefully everyone that's listening will uh, stay tuned. And we're in pretty good shape in terms of working capital right now. <clears throat> and I also like to emphasize that we have made sustainability and ESG principles a part of our <clears throat> development plan for over 10 years now. We saw early on how, if you're gonna produce these critical minerals for clean technologies, many of the end users would audit their supply chains to make sure they're produced in sustainable ways. So um, we embraced those principles over 10 years ago and <clears throat> got a risk rating from Sustainalytics Morningstar there last year. So um, <clears throat> that's, one of our important principles I like to emphasize, given the fact that the ESG investment community is growing quite rapidly too. <clears throat> and here's our uh, map of our various assets here in Canada. <clears throat> of course, Separation Rapids is what I'll be talking about today in Northwestern Ontario. We have a second lithium pegmatite project uh, just to the north, that's an earlier stage one, but has a lot of potential. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later. And the other project we've been keen to get started on is reactivating a closed mine site in Nova Scotia. That was the only primary producer of tin in North American history. And as I'll mention later, tin is now a technology metal too. <clears throat> and our Nechalacho project, which was our main focus 10, 15 years ago, was um, and the rare earths project that we almost got started back then. But um, <clears throat> I think to this day, China saw us coming and uh, that's what motivated them to relax the export quotas and we couldn't get the ball over the line to get the whole supply chain started. But back in 2018, I started to look at another model there where we could produce rare earths from some smaller near surface resources than the original one that we had defined. 
and it attracted the interest of an Australian company, Vital Metals. And so they've taken on that role of getting the whole supply chain started on that project. And it's going pretty well now, actually. They've been get, working on getting a plant established in Saskatchewan, and the Saskatchewan Research Council is now creating the separation capacity there and the, the ability to make the magnet metals. So it looks like we're on our way now to creating the whole rare earth supply chain here in, uh, in Canada and take advantage of the many resources that we have. And I always like to uh, remind people that this is a very different business than the traditional uh, mining industry in many ways, <clears throat> in that it's all about how you can design the product to meet the needs of the end users and you scale the operation based on the demand for that product. So that's principles that never applied in the historic mining industry, traditional industry, where it was only ever about tons and grade and trying to keep your, your costs as low as possible and produce exchange traded commodities. <clears throat> so I'm trying to encourage more um, regulatory change to recognize these fundamental differences and how this business works for commodities like lithium and rare earths and emphasize how it needs to be sampled at an early stage in order to define the process to meet the needs of the end users. So it's um, very different <clears throat> and I'm starting to get some uh, attention on that. And it's one of the reasons why I've been looking at historic mine waste as such an interesting opportunity in that many examples of closed mine sites that were developed for one traditional exchange traded commodity that have all kinds of other good stuff in the waste there that had no value then, but does today. So that's something that really needs to be looked at as an opportunity now. And on, Ontario's becoming more and more familiar with how we need to take advantage of the many critical minerals resources that we have in Northern Ontario and including lithium. There's no shortage of lithium pegmatites. So they're now starting to attract the end users. And that was always the thing that was missing in Canada is there were never buyers of these products to <laughs> support getting the whole operation started. But for the battery materials now, yes. And as you may be aware, we signed an MOU with LG Energy Solution there recently, and uh, we're on our way to firming up a relationship with them to help create that supply for them, and they'll help us uh, get the whole ball rolling. And I'm trying to also emphasize how there's lots of opportunities here for First Nations to take advantage of these resources. <clears throat> and that because they occur all over the place throughout the Canadian Shield, most First Nations would have opportunities to recover them in their traditional territories. And it can be done at a modest scale. And I always remind people that lithium is not a hazardous element. It's good for human health. So I think I'm starting to get more and more traction on that, actually. And hopefully... Um, more First Nations will start to see how they can take advantage of uh, these resources, develop them themselves, and start to participate more in the, in the economy. This is the map that shows where we're located. <clears throat> we're close to the uh, Manitoba border, north of the town of Kenora on the Lake of the Woods there, and it's called Separation Rapids. And because we're not that far north, we have pretty good uh, infrastructure access there. We're pretty close to the main line of the CNR. And we're also close to two major hydroelectric dams on the uh, English River there. And that's one thing we're looking at now is being able to take advantage of the proximity to use electrical power to power the operations uh, at the site when we get things uh, going there and keep it close to being net zero. 
And what we have at Separation Rapids is a very uh, unusual type of uh, pegmatite. It's the principal mineral and it is not spodumene. The two minerals that we have that contain lithium are petalite and lapidolite. And petalite is a pretty uh, unique mineral that's now in demand for uh, glass ceramics. Plus, we have lots of potential to produce other byproducts, including cesium, tantalum, and rubidium that's found in the feldspars and makes them a very attractive form of feldspar for certain ceramic products. So as we disclosed not too long ago um, in a news release where we announced that we have an offtake agreement with a major international glass ceramic manufacturer, now we're getting more and more interest in uh, creating a supply of petalite to serve that industry. Because petalite is the ideal way to introduce it into the uh, batch because it's lithium aluminum silicate and very high purity. That means they can, um, the other ingredients, aluminum silica, are also used in the, in the batch. And it's an easy way to mix it into the um, formulation there. And it has very low iron content. So that's what makes it particularly attractive. And now the demand is just skyrocketing because the traditional resources in Zimbabwe that have been major suppliers for many, many years are now totally controlled by Sinomine, the big Chinese mining company, and they're not sharing it anymore with the, uh, with the many end users around the world. So that's a really good opportunity for us and one that we want to try to serve as well as the, uh, the lithium battery materials market. So this is our land position there. The original discovery that was known as the Big Whopper is on the mining lease on the right hand side there. And it lies within a belt that contains other uh, similar lithium pegmatites. And there's a number on the northwest corner of the property, some claims we staked in a, a few years ago. And one of them, this we call a snowbank discovery, looks like it could be a very interesting resource too, in terms of both size potential and being very coarse grain and a good alternative for recovering the um, petalite from and meeting the needs of the glass ceramics end users. And right now we have a, uh, an aggregate permit that we're developing as a site to um, locate the initial process facility, a DMS plant on to start to produce some trial quantities of these products for the many end users out there that are asking us for it. And so this is this uh, snowbank uh, petalite, as we like to call it. You can see it's a big white outcrop and uh, on the left-hand side there. And the petalite in it is very coarse grained, as you can see in this um, photo on the lower right-hand side there. And it looks like there's lots of room for this to be a fairly sizable uh, resource as well. So... Um, we want to get going on drilling this um, sometime soon, as well as doing some more drilling on the main deposit, the Big Whopper, because we never found a bottom to it, and it may be a lot bigger than the 10 million tons that we have defined historically. So on the battery materials front, we've decided some time ago that um, the process facility is the most important part and the most expensive part of creating that whole uh, supply chain. And it made sense to put it in a major uh, city, Thunder Bay, that is also the transportation uh, hub for Northwestern Ontario. And we can create the initial supply to get it started. But um, the whole idea here is to try to attract other new producers to just produce the concentrates like from First Nations communities and then sell us the concentrates that we can then process at this facility to uh, meet the needs of the end users in the uh, battery markets. 
So um, that's been our plan for a while, and we're going to get quite a bit of uh, support for that, actually. Uh, we already have a lot of support to get it started from the Ontario and federal governments, and the City of Thunder Bay likes the idea, too, because it used to rely on the forestry industry, and, of course, that's in decline now, and uh, it's uh, this is a real opportunity to get the whole economy going there to take advantage of the natural resource wealth in the northwestern part of the province. So our vision is to um, establish that refinery and make it a separate business. We're going to call it Avalon uh, Lithium Inc. <laughs> Get lithium in the name associated with Avalon. And um, we've been looking for a partner to work with us on that. And we thought we had one in an Indian company named Asar, but they've been very slow to get going. But as I mentioned earlier, we now have a signed an MOU with LG Energy Solutions, a major Korean lithium battery manufacturer, planning to establish a facility in southern Ontario that they need a supply of the lithium hydroxide for. So I've, we signed an MOU. We're now in the process of... Uh, negotiating the details on that, but it's looking good that they'll help us attract the capital to get this whole uh, refinery business established. And we're now getting a lot of interest from other EV manufacturers, um, both here and in Europe, in North America and in Europe, major German companies are now looking at Canada as a really good opportunity to access all the critical min minerals they need for battery and electric vehicle uh, technology. And they're right. It's just a matter of being able to get these supply chains finally started here. So it's um, looking like a good opportunity for the province to expand the economy in the south and the north by taking advantage of our natural resources and diverse mineral wealth in the north there. And hopefully First Nations will take advantage of that too. So we did a, a PEA on uh, the lithium battery materials model back in 2016. And um, at that time, lithium prices were, hydroxide prices were much lower than they are today. So in this slide, I added in what the, the numbers might look like if we were to uh, assume a long-term price average of $20,000 per ton rather than $11,000 per ton, although right now it's a lot higher than $20,000 a ton. And you can see that that makes the profitability of this project a whole lot better. So on the next steps on moving forward, Basically, it's um, now about trying to finalize the uh, process. We wanted to um, get a bulk sample process that we collected in 2021. And we now have uh, an opportunity to, to do that with a potential investing partner that has a facility that could do it for us. And then get going on preparing the uh, site so it can start to produce the trial quantities of the uh, petalite that many end users need. And then we can start to also um, uh, get going on the battery material side. Right now we're in the process of finalizing a deal to acquire an industrial site in Thunder Bay that looks to be an ideal location to put that refinery on. It will be on the waterfront it's quite a large site, and um, we're, we should be able to get that done next month to uh, close the deal and uh, be able to hopefully get started on building that operation in uh, mid-2023. Then we'll continue with the processing um, technologies needed to uh, finalize the flow sheet and finalize our feasibility studies and do all the remaining uh, environmental assessment and permitting work that will need to be done. But as I mentioned earlier, at the site of Separation Rapids, there's nothing in the ore that represents a hazard to the environment. So I think I've got that message across now so that people can uh, relax and not worry about how mining just destroys the environment. <laughs> That's what most people think is the mining industry. 
<clears throat> unfortunately. And it looks like we can get going at a small scale next year with initial sales of the pedalite concentrates. We're planning to use that DMS plant to produce those trial quantities. And hopefully we'll get the battery materials operation going by 2025 or 26 at the latest. And I mentioned earlier our lily pad project and it's special because it's lithium pegmatites that are unusually enriched in the rare element cesium. And cesium is in very short supply right now and needed in a lot of new technologies. It is one that has been used to innovate a lot of new technologies, but there's not a, much of a supply right now and lots of potential for other things because it's the most electropositive element on the periodic table. All compounds that it forms are extremely stable. And um, now the pricing on it is very, very high, $5,000 a kilo for a cesium carbonate or cesium hydroxide. So that's a glorious opportunity to take advantage of here. It's a little bit more of a remote location north of Thunder Bay and near a First Nation community called uh, Iabamatung First Nation, Fort Hope. And um, the former chief is now on our board of directors, actually. And hopefully we can inspire that community to start to see how they can take advantage of this to participate in their resource economy going forward. And what makes us uh, particularly special is the fact that um, we have a dike there where the mineral polycite, that's the cesium ore mineral, occurs throughout the whole dike. And that's very unusual. I know of no other place in the world where there's a dike where the polycite is throughout the whole dike as one of the main rock forming minerals. So we have a very large potential resource there to um, develop and hopefully we can get that started at a small scale too to attract the interest of end users before too long and hopefully be able to create a new supply chain here and uh, inspire more innovation on many potential new products that can benefit from using cesium in the formulation. And I mentioned uh, tin briefly, uh, we still are inspired to try to reactivate that closed mine site in Nova Scotia. And what most people don't fully appreciate is just how tin is a metal that's really needed in many new technologies. And this study that was done at MIT by Rio Tinto in 2018 had tin as number one uh, amongst the metals most impacted by new technologies. And I attended a conference uh, earlier this year where um, there was a number of presentations on the new technologies where tin is being used. And it's amazing. It's demand is going to continue to grow because they're finding more and more ways to use tin in new technologies including in electric vehicles and battery technologies, solar energy systems, 5G communications, and the list goes on and on. So it's um, very important to be able to take advantage of a resource like this. And we have a resource there that was developed in the 80s. Unfortunately, the price of tin dropped then. They closed the operation uh, prematurely, but there's over 25 million tons of waste there. They only recovered half the tin that was in, in the uh, resource. And there's uh, 8 million tons of waste there that also has fairly high tin content. So all of this can be reprocessed to recover the tin. And the many other elements that are in the uh, resource, such as indium, gallium, germanium, copper, zinc, and lithium. Lithium is always in the wall rocks of these uh, tin grison type resources. And it was the only one ever developed in um, North America as a primary producer of tin. 
So now that it's so important in so many technologies, it's time to get it uh, started again. And hopefully we'll get the regulatory barriers out of the way to be able to do that, which includes BHP not allowing us to get access to the site right now because they still hold the surface rights. But I think we can get that straightened out before too long. Lastly, this is our uh, current management team, our board of directors. And we have a number of people that have worked for us in the past that retired and are still uh, helping us out where they can as consultants. So we're in a position now to move forward and probably need to grow our management team be, uh, before too long. So I'll leave it there and uh, take some questions if there are any. I was gonna to mention too that while um, I won't be available to do one-on-one -on -one meetings tomorrow. My colleague, Zishan Syed, who has been leading all the work on engaging with the various end users in the battery material space and the EV manufacturers, will be available to, uh, to take one-on-one -on -one meetings. So we're totally willing to do that. <clears throat> So I'm looking at the uh, questions here now. Now, the first one from Cameron Ross was, uh, do you see the Vital Metals Processing Plant in Saskatchewan as a competitor? No, I do not see it as a competitor, actually. The whole idea with uh, getting them to get the ball rolling was so that we could come in behind them and develop the resource once the whole supply chain had got started and the demand had started to grow for new supply because our resource at Nechalacho had quite strong enrichment in the heavy rarers, which the near surface resources that they're developing do not. Another question on, do you have an agreement with governments for funding or is it just in the talking stages no we don't have an agreement but um, there's a lot of interest in uh, supporting our aspirations on getting that lithium battery materials refinery established there so we just have to basically finalize the plan so we know what the ask is and then i'm sure we'll get significant funding from the government both ontario and the federal government Somebody's asking whether the um, lithium project is too low grade. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. It's not significantly different than uh, grades of other resources. And what you have to appreciate is that the mineral petalite, because it's a very high purity lithium aluminum silicate, it's also much easier to process to make the battery materials too. You don't have all the uh, other metals in it that have to be removed that can be toxic to the final product. So that's an advantage from a processing standpoint to be able to use a mineral like petalite. It's not about tons and grade. It's about quality of the product that you're able to make. I think that's most of the questions that I have there. There was one uh, question asking me if I'm still working with the uh, OSAR group. And um, they've just been very slow to um, make any sort of commitment. And um, because we've got so much other interest now, we'll see. Maybe they'll come in, but um, we'll uh, have to just wait and see. Hasn't been much communication there uh, recently.
Okay, well, I think my uh, time is up. Thank you very much for joining us today, and I'll uh, look forward to seeing uh, your emails and messages, and hopefully we can clarify any other questions that you may have had.